thanks to God for keeping us till now for his mercy and grace. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath day. May you speak to me and through me. And may you, O Lord, speak to us the words you desire us to learn as we are studying education. Dear King of glory, may your loving kindness go before us. Help us to understand that the way we can behold thee is by being educated in your word. Give us grace, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, uh, brethren, I welcome you back from the long week, and uh, I'm glad that we are continuing with our studies. So, we're covering part three. Last Sabbath, we were able to see that we are in education. It's a waste in us, in the schools, when we put aside the word of God for the sake of the books of the school. We realize that it is a waste to look for wisdom apart from wisdom. It's a waste to look for light apart from light. We realize that the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher. And not a matter of church only, but a matter of the whole of our lives. There is a book we shall read ahead. Uh, one of the we shall have certain studies out of that book. It will come along in this study, and that book is called "The Place of the Bible in Education." It is written by uh, Alonzo T. Jones. In that book, very very deep than any other book. And education and its implications. There is what he says that in the common law of the world today, things of the church or of the Bible have been seen as church things. And when it comes to our other parts of life, maybe in businesses or schools, school is seen as school, church as church. And these two are not linked together. So you realize that the church Bible is not an issue in the businesses. So people have moved with that attitude in the way of living life. But God never intended it to be that way. Instead, God intended that the Bible should be everywhere in the daily lives, in schools, in the businesses, but also should be what the church is. So, what has happened is to make a division in those. So we realize that it is a big mistake. We also realize that it's a mistake for us to think that we can go to the schools of the world, study their wisdom, and then come into the medical, into the missionary schools and we implement there the knowledge we get from those schools. She said it is a deception. It's not right for us to do that. In other words, we will, if we do that, we will repeat all the mistakes and seem to sandwich uh, uh, the word of God in infidelity or in wrong if we are not careful. So what we have to do is to Make sure the word of God is the basis of that education from the beginning to the end. Now, I realized, we also saw that um, in Eden, the school God established there was to be a figure for what is to happen for all generations, meaning even today. So, 
it's a conviction to you and I that there is no other education we should look to other than the method God established in the Garden of Eden. And therefore, if we are having another method of education other than that that was established by God in the Garden of Eden, it is a false education. It is an education that is not leading us to heaven, but leading us to hell. That is as clear as that. So it was a figure uh, that God desired to go through all generations. And we realize that in the beginning, Adam, the son of God, according to the book of Luke, was the forward or the priest of the house. And him and his wife Eve, they learned from God, their father. And when they learned from God, they taught the children. I see. So even today, it means that our basis or our dependence of wisdom should not be the intelligent men of the world, the philosophers, the physicians, biochemists, uh, all these kind of people, but instead our basis of knowledge and wisdom should be God, should be in prayer, should be by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have come to an attitude whereby we seem to have an attitude that the Holy Spirit is all about things of God, spirituality, and so on. But the Holy Spirit, maybe when you are practicing in um, surgery, or maybe you're practicing economy, economics, it's not natural for us to think that the Holy Spirit is the source of wisdom for me to do this economics thing, or for me to do this surgery thing. But rather... We think the Holy Spirit is just spiritual things. Again, it is the same issue of uh, separating God, uh, things of God to be aside, and things of our lives to be the other side. So you come to realize that our lives, when we are living today, we are to live everything in Christ likeness, everything in, the, in the dependence to the Bible. Because someone will ask, do you mean that every time you have to be holy, 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 or Christian, Christian, Christian? The answer is yes. Because Paul says that in everything that you do, either to eat or to drink, do to the glory of God. He does not say in most of the things. He says in everything that we do. I see. So the glory of God is to be the singular aim in our hearts and in our eyes. Now, I don't know how best I can explain this, but as God gives me utterance, I hope that you can get the point. The point as I have studied the Bible as an individual that I've come to, to realize is this. That the greatest of all commandments is this. Hear ye, O Israel, thy Lord is one God. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy heart, with all thy strength, and with all thy might. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as you love yourself. So as I've come to understand the Bible, friends, I'm being sincere and honest with you. It can take weeks. Even a camp meeting may not be enough to expound the whole of this matter. But in a nutshell, is that the greatest of all commandments was trying to show the greatest of all our duty as people who claim to serve God or to love God. And the whole of our duty is this, to love God with the whole of our hearts the whole of our mind, the whole of our strength and might. And when it says that, what does it mean for you to love God with the whole of your heart, mind, strength? It means that everything that you allow in your heart must be in subjection to holiness to God, must be in subjection to the will of God. Meaning anything you do with your strength, 
be it using your pen to write in your notebook. That must be done in subjection to God. Because if you say you love God with all of your strength, and yet in some things God is not the basis of it, you don't truly love God with all of your strength. You don't and I don't. You see? And I come to realize that the way how we can come to the point where we love God with all of our hearts, mind, soul, strength, when everything that is in our lives is all about God, it must be that everything that we put in our lives is all about God. And that means the, not the biggest, but the whole part of our lives should be God, God, God. There is no greater method that can give us that effect except education. Because the lives we live, they are lives of being educated and doing. If we are not doing the education that God intends for God to be everything to us, so that we can come to the point where we love him, not with most of our hearts, but with the whole of our hearts. Not with most of our strength, but with the whole of our strength. If we... Uh, don't do an education in that line. We must be doing an education in another line. So, this is what I came to understand. If there be ever anything that we must comprehend that is going to lead us to the portals of heaven, friends, is this, to love God. That is all. But love him how much? Or love him how? Again, just as the greatest commandment says, with the whole heart, the whole strength, the whole mind. No person is going to enter the kingdom of heaven without that test being passed. Now, in saying that, it's a deep conviction to myself and self-examination to myself. If I'm really doing that, you see? So, as a Bible student, it's a big conviction when I know that I am failing apart, you know? But that is really what the gospel is all about. To love God with all of our hearts, strength, mind, soul, spirit. Only by that can we enter the portals of heaven. So think about that. Think about that. I don't know how I can say it to really help this thing sink in the heart. To realize that the education we do, not limiting it to merely school, but our surroundings, our chosen associates, things we choose to look at on the internet, things we choose to listen to, all this is an education. I don't know how I can say it to impress it, sink in the heart to help you understand and get the impression that I have gotten that these things make us who we are. They choose where your soul lies, where is your heart, where is your strength. If it is most of the strength to God, but some bit is away from God. You and I don't love God with the whole of our strength. And without fulfilling the greatest commandment of all to love God with the whole of our strength, we cannot enter the portals of heaven. So, education is a death and life matter. If we can understand the science behind education, we can have a key to the question that says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? If we understand the science of education, you see the point. So it's not just about your books, your right, your course of study. No, it's deeper than that. 
we see. So last time we saw that if we fail and replace the most important thing with the things of the education systems of this world, we will have uh, we will have gotten that wisdom of the world at a big cost, at a very high price, the price of losing our souls eternally. So those are things we saw, some of them. And we came to realize in, in uh, Aden what was happening. Now for today, I'd like us to start the problem that came in uh, after God giving these people a direction. They messed up things. Let's first pray. Let us have a quick prayer and we proceed. Father in heaven, may your spirit still lead. May your Father speak to us in your word. May you, O oh Lord, take away the hindrance that we may be able to have your word. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, these people are not placed beyond the possibility of wrongdoing. But, um, so, he, it says that God might have created them without the power to transgress his requirements. But, in that case, there could have been no development of character. Their service would not have been voluntary, but forced. The something I understood, friends, God letting these people, because there are questions that we ask ourselves or our friends ask us if god knew in first place that we're going to sin why did he create us maybe or why did he let the devil do whatever he did why did he create the devil etc you see friends god in creating us and giving us that uh that possibility that we can go we can choose and do wrong or right. The thing he did, he did it out of love. How? This is what it means. If, we, if he created us in a way that we are not able to sin, we are not able to do wrong, it wouldn't, been, it wouldn't have been a voluntary service, but forced, would have been made like robots. And that means our happiness would reach somewhere and gets a limit. And, and when happiness is limited, you cease to be happy, or maybe you get so used to that level of happiness and it ceases to be happiness. Are you saying? And uh, you get a level of intelligence, which intelligence you don't have to go beyond that, and then you end there. So God gave it to us as a gift, a gift of choice, a gift of being able to expand. So the point is that God loves that loved us so much. He wanted us to experience happiness and joy in our love, in our life. And because of that love he had for us, he took a risk to make a, a, a being who will be able to go against, who will be able to choose, I should say. I, I say I get it the point. So it was out of love for him to do that. It was a gift. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to grow. We would have had a place where we get a limitation. So let's proceed. It says that in the Garden of Eden was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This knowledge, this tree, was a tree of knowledge, just as any other knowledge maybe we have we can have knowledge in bible study we can have knowledge in the schools so this true was a knowledge of good and evil mixed up together and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat that is in genesis 
skipping on down, she says that the knowledge of good had been freely given them. But the knowledge of evil, of sin, and its results, of wearing toil, of anxious care, of disappointment and grief, of pain and death, this was in love withheld. While God was seeking man's good, Satan was seeking his ruin. So when Eve, uh, disregarding the Lord's admonition concerning the forbidden tree, ventured to approach it, she came in contact with her foe. Her interest and curiosity have been, having been awakened, Satan proceeded to deny God's word. Continuing on. I believe we know this story, so I want to cut it short. We we'll continue here. She says that Satan desired to make it appear that this knowledge of good mingled with evil would be a blessing. Please note that. Not that. Satan made it to appear in such a way that if Eve gets this knowledge which is mingled with good and evil, it would be a blessing. How many today do we take the education system as a blessing and prioritize it so much and highly esteem it? Let's think about that. While we clearly know it's a mixture of evil and good. And why do we take it? Because the devil makes it appear in such a way that it is a blessing. Because you know you'll get this and that, etc. Let's continue. And that in forbidding them to take of the fruit of the tree, God was withholding great good. He urged that it was because of its wonderful properties for imparting wisdom and power that God had forbidden them to test it. That he was thus seeking to prevent them from reaching a nobler development and finding greater happiness. He declared that he himself had eaten of the forbidden fruit and as a result had acquired the power of speech and that if they also would eat of it, they would attain to a more exalted sphere of existence and enter a broader field of knowledge. You see, friends, the Bible says, as it was in the beginning, it will be also in the end. God illustrates the end from the beginning. So it is the same story today that is going on. In the black words down, um, okay, before that, let's read it all. While Satan claimed to have received great good by eating of the forbidden tree, he did not let it appear that by transgression he had become an outcast from heaven. So there is a deception we can have in the systems of this world. While they may present to us as if um, we are getting many good things, getting many, many... Uh, opportunities, being famous, being praised, being seen as people of certain levels. While we get that impression, there is a, a, a hidden thing from our side. And that fact is that by transgressing God's law, we actually cannot have a right to the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. Here was falsehood, so concealed and a covering of apparent truth. It was apparent truth, friends, that if infatuated, flattered, beguiled, they did not discern the deception. She coveted what God had forbidden. She distrusted his wisdom. How many times do, are we doing that, friends? We think that education that is founded on God does not have deep wisdom like the world is. That is called distrust in God. You see? So she cast away faith, the key of knowledge. 
When Eve saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. It was grateful to the test. In other words, you get great, you know, um, test to these systems. And as she ate, she seemed to feel a vivifying power and imagined herself entering upon a higher state of existence. You feel high, you know. You feel you're reaching a nobler standard. And it goes on to say, having herself transgressed, she became a tempter to her husband, and he did it. Your eyes shall be opened, the enemy had said. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Their eyes were indeed opened. But how sad the opening. The knowledge of evil, the curse of sin, was all that the transgressors gained. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. Now listen to this one. You study in chemistry, or maybe study in carpentry, things which are apparently good. Those things like carpentry, economics, entrepreneurship, etc. Themselves, there there is nothing poisonous in those things of themselves. I hope you get the point. As it is written here, there was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. And the sin was not merely in yielding to appetite. But the point is this. It was distrust of God's goodness. In other words, we don't trust that God's great goodness can do all these things for us, give us wisdom, and give us all this understanding when we make him the basis of our education system. So it was distrust of God's goodness, disbelief of his word, and rejection of his authority. I shall not have this man rule over me, was their problem. That made our first parents transgressors, and that brought into the world a knowledge of evil. It was this that opened the door to every species of wills of falsehood and error. Man lost all because he chose to listen to the deceiver rather than to him who is choose, who is truth. Man chose. Who alone has understanding? You know, so man chose to listen to the deceiver rather than him who is truth and who alone has understanding. So it's a decision, my brothers and sisters, whom we choose. So, by the mingling of evil with good, his mind had become confused, his mental and spiritual powers benumbed. No longer could he appreciate the good that God has so freely bestowed. We cease to look at these things, brethren, in our lives as great blessings with God, from God. When the rain comes, we feel, oh yeah, you know, you see, uh, the sun shone and then it hit the water and then the vapor came up, it went there and it made up the clouds and the rain came. And so when the rain comes, we feel it's normal, it's usual, obvious anyway. We plant and then we say, you know, according to this law and according to the heat and the warmth and this, etc., that's how the seed was able to germinate up. And so no big deal. That is expected. And then we grow up every day. Darkness comes in the evening. We don't know how it comes, but according to our physics, we say, you see, you know, darkness, this and that, when this iron, this and that combine up and this change comes in, this is how darkness comes. And then the light comes this way, the sun rises up. And so we say, yeah, you know, obviously it should have come to our night and obviously it's now morning. Let's move on and be happy. And life goes on that way. Little do we appreciate that by making God the basis of that education, not just looking at the laws of nature to be there like unchangeable, forgetting there is the maker of those laws. So I guess 
and I hope you are making the difference. It is true, the water evaporates and then helps in making the cloud. It's all true. But that process is not about the creator. There's someone who made that process. If we study that process on the basis of the maker, it helps us to exalt him and to see it as a gift, not as an obvious, narrowing it down to our human intellect. I think the point, that is what makes the difference. It is not in the learning of the process of sunshine, evaporation, cloud forming that is the sin. No, the sin is in neglecting and rejection of the authority and disbelief in this person who is responsible for creating that process and thinking that creator cannot change that process. Thinking he cannot bring the rain without evaporation. The same sin of the antediluvian world. They thought God can bring the water out of the sky simply because since creation always mist comes down from the ground and waters the plants. They had never experienced rain for all their lives. And they studied these things in such a way that they narrowed them down to their wisdom. And so God was not put in a picture. You see? That is the same problem today. Let's continue. So Adam and Eve had chosen the knowledge of evil. And if they ever regained the position they had lost, mark this, friends. Notice this point. If we are to ever regain back the position gave, God gave us in the Garden of Eden, gain back the holiness, there must be a way in which we are to, do, to get it. And that is, we must regain it under unfavorable conditions. If you really have a notebook, I wish you to note this one down because it's what is behind it. We must gain it under unfavorable conditions. And you know what we are doing today? We want to gain it back under favorable conditions. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a big problem. We think we can do as these Keynes and so on did, as we are going to see ahead in this study. They went and built themselves cities and so on and so on. You know, pleasure. The, the point is this city, the city, we have the city in, the, in heaven. You know? So they are doing the pleasure they are supposed to have in heaven here on earth. They miss the point. They want to gain back what they had lost under favorable conditions. Yet, the only way to gain it is through unfavorable conditions conditions. I don't know if you are learning the trick, the point there. So for us to gain back that, we must regain it under the unfavorable conditions. Unfavorable conditions uh, that they had brought upon themselves. No longer were they to dwell in Eden. Why? In dwelling in Eden, for in its perfection, it could not teach them the lessons which it was now essential for them to learn. You see? So it couldn't teach them. And so when we uh, practice city making and so on, or pleasure seeking, we cannot truly know God, just as they had said in the previous quotes we studied last time. So it says that in an unutterable sadness, they bade farewell to their beautiful surroundings and went forth to dwell upon the earth, where rested the curse of sin. So notice that in the knowledge of good and evil, taken by the pair constituted of that forbidden fruit, which was actually created by God, 
But at the same time, they disregarded the word of God, of which in John 1.1, 1, 1, God is the word, so they denied God. That means they took or desired and considered the work or works of God and wandered after them apart from their maker and creator. And this is termed false education. An education that constitutes of studying and desiring things that God created while he is not perfectly while he is not perfectly blended in the matter not as a supplement but as the basis ever, uh, as the basis ever and always as it was with Adam and Eve those that study about nature, for example, geography, science, art, etc., without nature's God, will always wander after these things and worship them in many forms of worship, like loving them more than they love God, which is idol worship. Eventually, this type of education, because of corruption, begin to imbibe the unclean th uh, they begin to imbibe unclean things which becomes a knowledge but a knowledge of good and evil i just hope that you get the point so uh, let us read this as we will soon be coming i think to uh, our conclusion, we have 15 minutes. It says that what was the way to conduct education? Let us try to look at this. How was education conducted? In Adventist home still, in the divine plan of education as adapted to man's condition after the fall. Now this is after the fall. Christ stands as the representative of who? Of the father. Last time it was the father. Now, it says that the connecting link between God and man, he is, the he is the great teacher of mankind. And he ordained that men and women should be his representatives. The family was the what? Was the school. And the parents were the what? The teachers, as simple as that. Again, the family was the school. And the parents were the teachers. The education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the day of patriarchs. The education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the days of the patriarchs like Moses, Abraham, Enoch, Noah, etc. For the schools thus established, God provided the conditions most favorable for the development of character. The people who were under his directions still pursued the plan of life that he had appointed in the beginning. Question, are we doing that? Are we still pursuing the plan of life that God appointed in the beginning? If we are not, we are missing a point. It proceeds, those who departed from God. Now listen, those who departed from God, what did they do? <laughs> They built for themselves cities and congregating in them glory in the splendor, the luxury, and the vice that make the cities of today the world's pride and its curse. Question, what does the education system today encourage us to do? Work in the cities, build more cities, build highways, no, make monies, have luxury, splendor, and then having pride and so on. Let's be honest, friends. That is the system today. Let's continue. So this is what was done back then. Those who departed from God, they built for themselves the cities, my brothers and sisters. Let's proceed. It says that, but the men who held fast God's principles of life dwelt among what? Among fields and hills. They were tillers of the soil and keepers of flocks and herds. 
And in this free independent life, with its opportunities for labor and study and meditation, the land of God and taught their children of his works and ways. This was the method of what? Listen, this was the method of education that God desired to establish in Israel. I tell you, friends, this just sums up everything and puts it in a perfect line. This was the method of education that God desired to establish in Israel, period. All right, let's continue. In ordinary life, the family was both a school and a church, the parents being the instructors in the secular and the religious lines. Amen. So let's have a summary now. No excuses, brothers and sisters. I, we even have more things. This is just a beginner a book for us to look into to understand education. But there are more things. There are curriculums examples, but this thing is open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There is no specific fixed curriculum. There are curriculums based on the guidance of the Holy Spirit we can do. Start where we are. Those things are there. There are guides on how we should do this. There are guides on what courses should we study. We are guides on all those things. So we are proceeding. So this is one of the sweet things that I came across uh, trying to show the summary of the system of education uh, that is clearly shown in the Bible. Nowhere else but in the Bible. Remember the Bible is our rule of faith, is our basis, is our major textbook in true education. So let's use the Bible. Listen, now, uh, you can note this if you are noting so to learn the plan of ancient Israel, read Deuteronomy 6. Go with me there. <clears throat> uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 7 to verse 10. To learn the plan of ancient Israel, read Deuteronomy 6, verse 7 to verse 6, where instruction is given in the home school. All the teachers of the secondary and the higher schools were to be what? Levites. And were paid from what? Tithes. Verse 7 says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou dost what? Sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by thy way, and when thou liest down, and when thou dost what? Risest up. Can you imagine? As in, it is what life is all about. When you walk, when you sit, when you sleep, when you wake up. But are we doing that today, friends? And are we surprised why we are not getting special spirituality, special relationship with God? That is why we are in up and down relationship with God. On and off, singing and repenting and so on, and until you die and Judgment shows that you're supposed to die in the fires of hell. Do we do that? That is just one verse. Sweet verse. Let us read it again. Verse 7, Deuteronomy. It says that, that. It says that. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Interesting. Eight, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee in the land, into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou you will just not. You can continue in your free time. So, teaching was to be there. Let's continue. To show that they had a school in every church, read his Chronicles. Go with me to Chronicles 17, 2 Chronicles 17, verse 7. 
This is to show that they had a school in every church. Okay, 17 verse 7. What does it say? It says that, uh, I hope you're there, Second Chronicles 17 verse 7. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to ben -Hel, and to Obadiah, and to Zechariah, and to Nathaniel, and to Michiah, to teach, to do what? To teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, even Shemaiah, and Nathaniah, and Zebadiah, and Asahel, and Shemiram, Shemir, Shemiramoth, and Jonathan, and Ad, Adonijah, and Tobijah, and Tobadonijah, these were Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, those were priests. Verse 9, And they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and went about throughout all the cities of Judah, and taught the people. Let's continue. We learned that they had a school in which workers were trained, called a college, or school of the prophets. So there were schools, there was a school in which workers were what? Were trained. And that was called a college. We read that in Second Chronicles again. So move, continue with me to chapter 32 in Second Chronicles. Uh, 34, sorry, verse 22 in the Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 34, we're reading verse 22. It says this, And Hilkiah, and they that, and they that the king had appointed, went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the what? In the college. And they spoke to her to that effect. So there were colleges. You can in your free time read First Samuel chapter 10, verse 9 to 13, and Second Kings chapter 4, Verse 38, those will show you what was called the school of the prophets. Let's proceed. It says, this plan of education, listen, this plan of education, when strictly followed out, placed the Israelites at the head of learning. Just imagine, friends. We may keep complaining, we don't have the schools, we don't have the missionary schools. But who will do it if you and I don't step up to do it? We have to initiate and put into effect. So who will do it? We cannot keep complaining, we don't have the missionary schools. There are these schools of the prophets today and these missionary schools today and they are corrupt according to what we read. And even the prophecy in timeline in this book that we are going to see ahead. But still, it remains with you and I to start true colleges, missionary colleges, I see. So when we do this, friends, as do we practice God's will, the geographies, the anatomies, the whatever, these subjects, economics, in this basis on God's sure word, as the Holy Spirit leads, I tell you, it places us at the head of learning. Believe it or not, you may not really believe it now because ever since you were born, even your grandparents, they even never witnessed that education. But do it, the Bible is true. And this happened back then. It placed the Israelites at the head of learning. Let's proceed. It says that when strictly followed out, placed 
the Israelites at the, at the head of learning. And it is said that they were regarded by the pagan nations round about thus, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Listen now. Now, there are people, at times we tend to think that Solomon's wisdom, like it came from heaven all, you know, out of the blue and fell in his head and out of the blue Solomon was very wise. No. Solomon had to undertake strict true education. And by taking it, the holy, uh, the holy God, our Father, blessed him. But it was not a sudden happening. It was taking true education. Let's read this. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. His fame was in all nations round about. That is 1 Kings chapter 4, 29 to 34. The Bible was the basis of their principal studies. The Bible, again I repeat, was the basis of their principal studies, which were the, the what? These are some of the subjects they studied, which were the natural sciences, Read that in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 3. That was subject called natural sciences. Comma. The study of the law. That is the Bible in terms of studying the law. Sacred history. That is histories, but that are sacred. Not just any kind, you know. Histories, learning these many histories, which are not going to benefit you. So when we are studying intro education, we are not going to study histories of what, what different countries and so on, etc. We are going to study histories which are making up prophecy. For example, if you bring the history of the Dark Ages, now you're talking. If you bring the histories of Alexander the Great, etc., etc., and you see that these things are connecting to Daniel chapter, you know, uh, two and and so on, now you are talking. So they studied sacred history. They also studied sacred music, how to play those different instruments, the violin, the guitar, the pianos, etc. They studied poetry. They studied agriculture. And they studied also horticulture. You see? Now listen to this beautiful sentence. It says that the Lord himself directed the education of Israel. And he wishes to direct our education when? Today. But we don't give God a chance. That's our problem. Why? We distrust him. We distrust his wisdom. We distrust his understanding as if it is really very hard to have a deep understanding and wisdom when we make him to direct us. As if if he does and the systems of the world is the only way out for us to know. That is our problem. The same problem of Eve, to choose to take that fruit. It was not the fruit of itself that was the sin, but distrust and rejection of the authority of the Creator. I hope you're getting your eyes open when we are proceeding with this subject. We are yet just starting. It is so deep, so deep, and you will truly appreciate because what this really helps us, friends, it is an answer to the person whose heart is yearningly asking, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? It is a method. It is a medium. There is no way we are going to love God with the whole of our hearts, with the whole of our souls, with the whole of our strength, with the whole of our minds, without making things that pertain to God our education. No way. There must be an education to us. Let's conclude. Uh, I've already entered time for questions. 
but um, let me read this quote. Let me finish this quote and we shall start from there. Schools of the early church. We are still continuing. We are reading this from the book called Pamphlet. This is Pamphlet number 81. Okay. Schools of the early church. Education among the early Christians has been beautifully portrayed by Coleman. <laughs> Sorry. The tender solicitude of these early Christians for the religious instruction of their children, he says, is one of the most beautiful characteristics. They taught them even at the earliest dawn of intelligence, the separate names of God and the Savior. They sought to lead the infant minds of their children up to God by familiar narratives from scriptures of Joseph, of young Samuel, of Josiah, and of the holy child Jesus. The history of the patriarchs and the prophets, apostles, and holy men, whose lives are narrated in the sacred volume where the nursery tells. Now, let me ask you, which kindergarten schools make these their nursery tales? Nothing like that today. Nothing. So these were the nursery tales with which they sought to form the tender minds of their children. As the mind of the child expanded, the parents made it their sacred duty and delightful task daily to exercise him in the, in the recital of select passages of scripture relating to the doctrines and duties of religion. The Bible was what? the entertainment of the fireside, how many can take pleasure in using the Bible as an entertainment on the fireside when you're seated outside there with your friends, your parents? How many? You know? It's very hard. It's very hard. Except to see them scrolling on their phones and Jesting and joking and laughing and, you know. So think, think about this. It was the first and the last, the only school book almost of the child, the sacred psalmody, the only song with which his infant cry was hushed as he was lulled to rest on his mother's arm. As in even when the baby would cry, it was the psalms that were sung to the baby. But today it is very rare to even find scripture songs. You hunt for them with candles and you don't find them. Let's continue. The sacred song and the rude melody of its music were, from the earliest periods of Christian antiquity, an important means of impressing the infant heart with the sentiments of what? Of piety and of imbuing the susceptible minds of the young with the knowledge and faith of scriptures. Of scriptures. I hope you are really enjoying and seeing what this can bring us to. It proceeds saying, free from worldly schools. It, it says, the purpose of these early Christian parents, as of the ancient Jews, was to train up their children in the fear of God. In order that, the children might be exposed as little as possible to the corrupting influence of heathen association. Their education was conducted within the healthful principles of home. As a result, they grew up without a taste of the basic pleasures. They acquired domestic tastes, and when the time came, they took their place as consistent not on and off Christians, but consistent and honest workers in the church. The beauty of this character made its impression or upon an age notorious for its vice. Question, friends, today, is our age notorious for its vice? Yes, look at what is on the television. The wicked things everywhere, like this is an edge of, of vice, of sin. 
but it is you and I who are commissioned brothers and sisters to come up and reform, to bring back the old method of education. It is very hard to find, I'm telling you, in the whole world, very hard, but you and I, it begins with you and I, it doesn't matter even if it is not in the whole of Africa, it doesn't matter. It is you and I that have to study it now. So we have to have this character be beautiful and make an impression upon this age, friends, of a notorious wickedness. So it exhorted unwilling praises from the enemies of Christianity. Even these people are enemies to Christianity. When they see our methods, you know, our carpentry is so different. Our way well of treat the patients and so on, the results, economy, things are so different. Actually, it will raise up unwilling praises from these enemies of Christianity. So a celebrated heathen orator exclaimed, what wives these Christians have? Like, they were surprised. These men have, what wives men these men have? A noble testimony, says a writer of, a no, of note, to the refining power of woman, and the most beautiful tribute of the gentle, persuasive influence of her piety, which all iniquity, heathen or Christian, furnishes. Interesting. So these men had wives, wives who understood their duty based on the education they have received, education that is based on the word of God. They know a wife is to be submissive. They know a wife is still to regain her individuality, however. They know a wife is not to lift her voice to the husband. So these were the most wonderful wives they have ever seen. And so they said, wow, what wives these Christians have. But today, friends, how many wives are really wives according to the Bible? Very few, very few. At the end of it all, we again realize it is missing a point <clears throat> in the education system that all these things come to be as they are today. It's missing a point in the education system. So I believe you're enjoying and realizing the wonderful results that can come out of this if you and I choose to do it. There's no way we are going to wait for someone else or maybe you seek out for a certain school or maybe a missionary school. I tell you, I'm not saying there's nowhere else there's true education. There are those out there who are really doing it. But they're very hard to find. And because of their humble ways, it's hard for them to even be famous. So the point is, we cannot look out for school. We think maybe in Kenya, or maybe in Tanzania, or maybe in Zambia, or California, nothing. It starts here. Many of those schools, so-called missionary schools, they are corrupt. And as we continue to study, we will see that. You see? So it starts with you and I to bring back true education. Manifully take it up. Have faith in God. Raise it up. Be very careful, prayerful. God can help us not to repeat the mistakes. And those results by and by will come. And I'm telling you, I have a conviction only the 144,000 people, how holy and perfect they are, you cannot develop that character when you're in the system of this world or when you have not unlearned the system of this world. I'm telling you, it is impossible. It's very impossible. Those people are special. So if we ever dream of being among them, we must bring back primitive godliness, as it is written in the Great Controversy. And education is the only method. So I hope you get the point. Now the floor is open. Uh, I have two minutes to make your comments and ask. Please, if something is not clicking to the mind, feel free, ask. And, um, Thank you, Brother Lambert, for sharing. We thank God 
for that message that he passed through you. Me, I'll just say, it goes back to the parents. It goes back to the parents, whoever dreams of being a parent someday. It goes back to them. They are supposed to educate themselves on these principles. They are supposed to read what the word of God says. They are supposed to read those books yeah. on the knowledge of God, wisdom of God. And they are the ones who are going to put this in their own children, themselves. It starts with them. So unlike what is happening today, I was listening to... I was listening to a journalist. Yeah, one of the journalists in Uganda. He's he's not Adventist, but he has some godliness in him, the way he speaks, the things he says, you know. And he was explaining us like today parents they are doing their own things, you know. Because for him, he goes to church on Sunday. So he was giving the example. It's like children these days don't even go to church. They don't go to Sunday school. Even the Muslims themselves, they don't take their children to the mosque, you know. And then by Sunday morning, they are nursing a hangover. Hmm? They were partying all night, Saturday. And then Sunday, when they are supposed to go to church, they are nursing a hangover. Hmm? They wake up at 11 and put in a series, you know? And then when are you going to tell your child to go to church? How are you going to tell your child to go to church? How? You yourself, you're not going. How are you going to tell your child not to do such and such a thing when you yourself, you're doing it? So it, it starts with parents. And then he was like, according to science, they say a child like makes a character, they learn so much of the things that will impact their whole life between the age of one and seven. That age is very, very vulnerable and critical. But you realize that is the time when most parents are actually absent in their children's lives. Today, that is what happens. That is the time when parents are not actually with their children. They leave them with the maids. For them, they go to work or they go to have fun, that kind of thing, and they neglect the child. They leave that, that duty to teachers in school, you know? And like, I'll take the child to school. I'll take the child to school. And then they neglect their role completely. So who is supposed to do that role? It goes back to the parent. And the parent will not do that role unless they have equipped themselves with knowledge themselves. So parents have a lot of work to do. They are the first teachers. And as we learned, the home is the first school. So that is what I'll say. Thank you for sharing. Amen. You're welcome, sister. Brother Okoy. Ms. Brothers, um, thank you for the study. Uh, uh, the verse that caught me or caught my attention. This verse of 24, um, where, uh, where Moses says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgment, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither as ye go to possess it. Then in verse 6 he says, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom. Okay. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom, and your understanding in the sight of the nations. We shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely, this nation is a wise and understanding people. Yeah, so uh, as you were speaking, uh, so in context here, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's clear what our education should really be. Uh, it's not, uh, when we talk about education, it's not just uh, about uh, the 
school, as you said in the beginning, uh, when you connect this to, to John, John 17, when Christ says uh, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ and thou sin. That, 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 that knowledge, which is uh, what uh, we glean or what we gather from, uh, from nature, or from the study of God's word, that education, knowing God in reality, and uh, uh, expressing his will, or doing his statutes, keeping his statutes, will make us distinct by default. And that's why Paul, uh, Moses is saying, the world will see how distinct you are and will say, surely, this is a wise and understanding nation. And why will we be distinct? Because we have a, an indication of God. Where we know God, where we know the statutes, where our life is different. And that also entails uh, what we study as material, what we study. It's just a part of it. But the big thing is uh, what, what, what will make the people to say that we are really a wise and understanding nation is the education of God. The, 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 uh, having the statutes of God, having the different character, like you mentioned about 4,000. It's ha having the knowledge of God, and knowledge of God includes also what we study in school and learn. So uh, may, 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 may God keep this thing in mind that uh, this education entails more than uh, just school. It is actually learning of God. Okay. Oh, that's all I have to say. Amen. Thank you, brother. So, uh, the comment of Sister Jamina. Parents did fast. And uh, that puts you and I in. Because now we, all, we, all, we hope maybe sometime we'll also be parents. But now, when we are doing this education, teaching education, the first thing we're supposed to do when we're implementing it is to train the parents. That is it. We have to train the parents first. What is true education? What they're supposed to do? And how to train the children. And also, in fact, a child, the most, the, the most sensitive age of their learning scientifically uh, something even Ellen White also approved. I don't know if it's scientific approved, but inspiration proves it. Uh, after some months, that one also science proves it. After some months, in a womb, the child begins to hear. I don't remember how many months, but the child begins to hear from the womb. In the Bible, take an example of when Mary, the mother of Jesus, met uh, Elizabeth. And... Uh, the child in uh, John the Baptist, John, when he was still in Elizabeth's womb, it leaped for joy. Why? Because the voice of Mary was heard and she sensed the presence of Jesus. It's interesting. So the Holy Spirit was in their mind while they were babies. Uh, so they can hear from the womb. And from there, their behavior is being shaped. And Sister Ellen White says up to the age of three years. That is the most educative, uh, it is the most uh, <clears throat> affected age for a child. When the child exceeds three years, their characters begin to fix, to fix in such a way that they are not changeable uh, quickly. And when they go beyond seven years, they are more fixed, you know? Yeah, so it's very, very important, even when having a child in, in the womb till the three years of age. Okay, uh, let us... Well, just to come in a little. Yeah? Uh, yeah, what you're saying is really shocking me. Uh, it's very new. <laughs> Very new to my ears, you know, uh, that uh, the child. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> the child begins learning, you know, when he's that young, and by the age of three, by the age of three is, is uh, uh, almost, uh, you know. Character is fixing. Uh, 
character. That is troublesome to me because uh, it calls for a lot of, uh, huh? yeah, so it calls for a lot of uh, 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 reformation because it's troublesome. For, for example, the, the background I come from, that is trouble. in a way that uh, born, uh, she has to go back to the parents, okay? I don't know how, how it may be the same in your place, but she has to go back and give back with parents so that uh, she can learn some things as, as, a, as a first mother. I get married and you, you know these principles, what you to teach your child. Yes. Yes, so it is that serious. And to their own, who are not crazy, already fixed with wrong characters. That is troublesome. It is. It is. And interestingly, like I, I wanted to comment, what is very unfortunate is that that is the time parents are most like after birth, specifically after birth. That's when you find in those early years, that is when parents are most absent in their children's lives. If you come to think of it during that time, these days parents, mothers will breastfeed the child for a few months, hmm? six months. When the child starts eating solid things, she disappears. She takes the child to the grandparent, hmm? because her and the husband, they are going to look for money. She has gotten a job up country. Hmm? She's working the other side, the money is working the other side, and then they take the child to the what? To the grandma. Like they are completely absent, completely absent. And then they won't even call. Hmm? They won't even call like every day to hear from this child. Hmm? Some travel abroad to work. Those years, actually, I'm also, I hadn't really thought about it like that previously. Like children learn so much at such an early age, very early. Yeah. And yet that is the time kids are very, very absent in the child's life. So I think parents have a lot to learn. I wish during the, the premarital sessions, Catholics have them. I don't know about Adventists, how they do it. I think Adventists have it, how they do it. Catholics have this thing, like if you're going to get married, you study. They get the couple and then you will have classes, real classes about marriage, like concerning the both of you, everything. So I don't know how Adventists do it, but I think they should do that. People should have a serious course of like six months, serious study. Hmm? training parents to be parents. Besides being husband and wife, their duties and everything, they have to teach them how to be parents. I think it would be important. A real course, like real, real course, where you even get a certificate. I think if it came to that. Yeah, uh, you're, you're really right. And Sister Lynn White puts a comment somewhere. I don't know, is it Adventist Home? She says that Husband and wife have not taken time to learn all knowledge knowledge they need. And when she says that, she means many things in that. For example, I have some friends, uh, they get married, they don't intend to you know, have a child from day one, and then they find themselves having a child while at the same time they are doing right to avoid the unnatural, the unhealthy way of family planning and so on. So there are many things people need to have uh, in marriage and also child training to learn how they're going to raise up these children. But um, just as you have said, that is important. And I'm, I will be honest to you, it is a, a by the way issue in Adventist church. So in true education, we have to do it. See? We have to do it. It begins with us. So may the Lord help us uh, to implement these crucial things. Because Sister Noite quotes it somewhere. She says that these 
husband and wife, they have not learned the knowledge they need. And when she says that, when you were saying that, it made me remember that statement. So it's true. There is a need for people to learn these things. Um, so good effort has not been put on this. People don't understand education. I'm telling you things we are studying here. Very few people understand this depth of matters. And it's very deep then. So I've just started it. So as you can see, when what the stories that have been talked about by this man called man, that from the infancy, when the first dawn of intelligence came to the child, you know, maybe at breastfeeding, you know, they can differentiate this and that. They can see, they can hear. But then they begin to sing for them these scripture songs, speak to them. Even if those babies don't speak back to you, you are educating them. I'm telling you. Some people get surprised eh, when they see these uh, little children doing wise things. We, we, there's nothing like to be surprised. Those babies have a very intelligent, a very high intelligence, which needs to be directed. I see. So these people, these children were made to grasp long passages of scriptures and putting them in script in songs and the child could recite verses off head. So there that is looked at as a wow, that's amazing, he's a genius. No, 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 no. Children are that intelligent. They have that disc on which you have to store a lot and they are so hungry. That's why they ask. They keep looking, they are so curious. He's here, he's there, he's there, he's there. You know, everything, they open and so on and so on. So that brain, needs wisdom to be put in it in a correct method. And people today, they no longer understand that. But a child, even when he doesn't speak or she doesn't speak, he's learning whatever you're doing. I'm telling you, they are being educated. I see. So if it is not God's things, they're being educated by the devil. All right. Uh, we thank God for the session. We shall continue studying. It is a half past nine. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study we have been having. We pray that you may continue to teach us and guide us on how to know you, on how to be educated in your ways. Lord, let it begin with us. And I pray that you may give us wisdom, courage, and grace to also take this to the parents. And those that are already parents, those that are will are hoping to be, that we may educate them in this. Because this is a great method by which primitive godliness will come. There is no other method that weighs above this one. Help us as our prayer. Bless us in this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.